I think we're ready to go. We're ready to yep. start. I'm pleased to welcome committee members, and we also have two new student members to our uh, esteemed committee. Uh, Joseph Adraji, the new student trustee, who just walked, just walked in, in, just saying welcome. <laughs> like right on cue, great timing. Um, and student member Lucas Almonte, Almonte. welcome. And guests to the Committee on Student Affairs and Special Programs. Everyone should have some form of electronic device, iPad, laptop, iPhone, to access the agenda and other supporting documents for this meeting. There are 10 copies of the agenda and supporting documents on the table if you prefer. Anybody prefer? Okay, we're good. There are two action items and one information item before the committee. Our first action item is approval of meeting minutes. Yes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting of the September 8th, 2014 meeting? So moved. Thank Second. You. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are approved. Okay. Our second action item is approval of the proposed amendments to the bylaws of the Board of Trustees to Article 15. Senior Vice Chancellor Frederick Schaefer and Vice Chancellor Frank Sanchez will now provide an overview of the proposed amendment to Article 15. Gentlemen? Yeah. Um, well, this is the, uh, with one small exception, this is the same item that was before us at our last meeting as an informational item uh, when we gave notice uh, to, uh, of the intent to amend the uh, uh, bylaws of the Board of Trustees. As you know, our procedure is to give notice at one meeting and then to bring it forward at the next board meeting uh, for action. And so, uh, uh, You'll all recall there was extensive uh, discussion about this at the last meeting. These are changes uh, largely, uh, uh, but not entirely, as a result of uh, uh, changes in federal law and guidance concerning sexual assault cases. And the principal uh, change uh, in the uh, student disciplinary procedures in Article 15 uh, as a result of those changes in federal law and guidance uh, was to include the complainant uh, as a much more involved and active participant uh, in any disciplinary proceeding. And we went over those changes at, uh, I think, some detail in the um, rationale for them at the last meeting. Um, so I I'm not going to go over it again. There may be some questions about it. Um, I would like to point out one small change from uh, the draft that uh, you saw and uh, I didn't redline it because it was just the one thing, and it is, um, I think, completely uncontroversial. Uh, and that is in uh, section 15.4 uh, under, and this would be one, two, three, not numbered pages, but one, two, three, fourth page where uh, subparagraph F, this is the notice that uh, a respondent receives when they have been disciplinary charges. Um, uh, the uh, notice contains under F2-4 uh, the, the, uh, the right to be represented by an advisor or legal counsel at their expense. And then the following sentence was added because it was such a obvious and good idea, and we should have had it in there from the beginning, which is the following language. If the respondent or the complainant request it, the college shall assist in finding a legal counsel or advisor. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, and, and in fact, Madam Chair, I think you may have pointed this out. <laughs> in any event, um, uh, it was a good idea, uh, wh whose ever idea it was, um, and so we added that language. We didn't think there would be any uh, possible objection or controversy about that. Um, so, so these are the, the, the proposed amendments. Uh, we, yeah. as I said, discussed them at the last meeting, uh, and uh, it's now before you as an action item, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have uh, uh, about it. So if the college provides 
advice to a student, uh, and, and, and that leads to the appointment of counsel, a student is still liable to pay for it? Yeah, we don't, we don't have yeah. funding for this, and so we're, we're not in a position to provide free legal counsel. And it is true, I think, at this point in close to half the cases that students do appear uh, either with an advisor or counsel. Um, and students who want an advisor or counsel, I don't think there's been a great deal of difficulty, particularly an advisor. Counsel's a different matter because you usually have to pay. Um, but uh, we, so, so I'm not sure this has been a problem, but just in case student needs some assistance, uh, obviously we ought to provide it in helping them find somebody. Who from the college would typically serve as an advisor to a student? Would it be the someone in the Student Affairs Office? Often they bring a friend or family member, or sometimes it's a fellow student. It's not one of our employees, <coughs> as that would present a possible conflict of interest. Okay, all right. Any other questions? May I have a motion I, to approve? I have, yes. a, I have a question. The, Professor. The, and it wasn't immediately obvious that this was a change. The original document in F2 said that a student could remain silent without um, I think there's some more verbiage here. Uh, Without assumption of guilt. guilt. And that's been removed. Could we discuss that? Sure. Surprise now, th that was bef that same change was yes. before the committee at last the last time. meeting. Yeah. That's, that's not a new change. That has I been. Uh, and, and the reason for that, uh, there are several reasons. The, um, the law, it, it, the, the provision that is being deleted is a misstatement of law. That is to say, in a non-criminal proceeding, obviously one has the right to remain silent in any proceeding uh, pursuant to the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. That's why I'm asking you. However, the right not to have any adverse inference drawn from silence exists only in a criminal proceeding, right. not in a, in, in a non-criminal proceeding. Right. These disciplinary proceedings are non-criminal proceedings, and so it is normal in any non-criminal proceeding that if, and this happens very rarely, by the way, it's happened once in the 14 years that I've been at CUNY, but if it occurs in a disciplinary proceeding that a student wishes to assert his right to remain silent, um, the law is that an adverse inference can be drawn from that. Doesn't necessarily. It doesn't have, have to, be. to be. It's up to the fact it's up finder. To the, all the circumstances. Right. To give it whatever weight the fact finder wishes. But the statement that existed as to that right uh, previously was simply an incorrect statement of the law. That's number one. Number two, the reason for deleting it is that, in fact, nobody else has that right. That is to say, the law is that in a non criminal proceeding, if you refuse to testify, an adverse inference may be drawn. And so, for example, in faculty disciplinary proceedings, in those rare cases, and it has happened once or twice during my tenure, where a faculty member, where there was a parallel criminal investigation, and the faculty member was advised, uh, well advised actually, uh, not uh, to testify, uh, we did ask the fact finder to draw an adverse inference. There was no such provision or right, if you will, uh, in the collective bargaining agreement or any other document relating to faculty members. And then the third reason uh, for uh, its uh, removal uh, really relates to the recent experience we had, which was the first time in 14 years where this actually arose in a disciplinary proceeding. And this was the, the, the tragic hazing uh, incident involving Baruch College students in in a retreat in Pennsylvania right. where a student uh, died as a result of the hazing. And in that case, um, there obviously was a serious violation of the anti-hazing policy of Baruch College. It had tragic consequences. The college quite rightly felt that it had to go forward with disciplinary proceedings. It could not await the outcome of the criminal investigation and trial, which was predictably going to be the case that it was going to last two or three years, and we're now at the roughly the one-year anniversary, and the trial is nowhere in sight. Um, and it was very, very difficult in those cases to present cases to the disciplinary uh, panels because, as is always the case, the prosecutors don't want to share information. 
Um, and uh, we, we were, I would say, in a sense, fortunate or lucky that there were a few students who did testify. And if that hadn't have happened, we might very well have found ourselves in a position uh, where we could have taken no disciplinary action despite the very, very serious nature uh, of the offense. So it was really that experience uh, that uh, uh, led uh, me and, and others within my office to feel that we needed uh, to, uh, to uh, modify this provision, to bring it into conformity with what the law is uh, regarding uh, the right uh, uh, not to incriminate yourself. But, of uh, course, student testimony then could lead to real criminal. Uh, if, there, if students are, do testify, um, are not <coughs> given the right to remain silent without adverse uh, inference, the, what they do say then could be later used in a criminal court. That is true, and that's why we provide in F3 mm -hmm. that the notice shall contain a warning that anything the student says may be used against her or him at a non-college hearing. And I can certainly assure you that not only will the notice contain that pursuant to this provision, but my office in dealing with these situations and the colleges in dealing with these situations, if they know that there is a potential for a criminal case, they will advise the student that he really ought to be. He ought to be, he ought to have counsel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got a question about um, clarification. Um, so removing the right to remain silent about some guilt is not required by Title IX. Is that correct? That's correct. That, that the origins of this came from a different experience. So um, I'm going to ask the chair about a motion to approve all the amendments without the one provision and we spoke separately on that one provision? In other words, taking it apart? As a piecemeal, yeah. yeah well, I, I think normally as a matter of, 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 uh, of, uh, of Robert's Rules of Order, what you would, would do is to amend these, this uh, resolution to, del to put that back in and, and see if the committee wants to do that, and then uh, if it does, you know, we would vote on the whole document. That's the thing um, for us is that as a, you know, students, we don't want to um, impede in regards to the university being compliant with Title IX. We agree with Title IX. We want the university to move forward and make sure that we're complying with Title IX. And because this line does not um, impede in that progress, we hope that we can vote on all Title IX amendments and then vote on this one line separately from the bylaws. That way we can, one. Well, you would move that it be deleted. And that we, we would take that up before we take up the larger question. No, that we take the larger question first, which is all the amendments to Title IX, and then vote separately on the line for right to remain silent. Uh, I, you could do it in either order. Either, either order. To approve this subject to a, a possible amendment after the yeah. approval. Just, just a point of clarification, um, uh, Council and, um, and, and Ms. Jamalte. Uh, we're talking about the, the disciplinary code for... CUNY uh, separate and apart from the the sexual harassment. This is this is just the disciplinary. Right. We're just talking about the amendments. So we're talking so about Article, Article 15 and That's not correct. Article 9 per se. Yeah. Right. Right. Not so just right. just for clarification. So this is the sort of the entire body. So this would apply to boys, girls, men, women yeah. in terms of the, exactly. the, the 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 piece, and it's it's correcting an error that never should have been there to begin with, right? So it was an overstatement. That, that's right. And, and uh, I would, you know, recommend against uh, what, uh, what uh, Lucas is, is suggesting, um, having nothing to do with, with Title IX, but because the, the, the existing language is a, is a misstatement of the law, it, it provides a right to students, a so-called right to students that faculty and staff don't have, and that in the rare instances where it arises, it could well impede uh, an appropriate and necessary disciplinary proceeding. So for those reasons, I would argue against it. But procedurally, we can go either way. We can uh, vote on this and then subject it to an <coughs> amendment, or we could do the amendment first and then vote on the whole policy. I don't think it matters. So it's really up to you, Madam Chair, as to what order you want to take it in. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable looking at it in terms of um, the policy with the exception of the sentence in question and and then we can have a, a separate conversation on that um, so may I have a motion to approve uh, the parts of the policy that were stated with the exception of the the one sentence that were raised um, is there a motion so to approve second 
Any discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that motion is approved. And so the, the, the second part is the um, question on the table regarding the one sentence that has been uh, deleted and changed. And from what I understand from council's representation, that those were really a technical correction more than anything else, if I understand correctly. Um, to leave the language in, it looks like would be giving almost a false, in other words, it's, it would be legally void. Is that correct? Well, I don't know that it was legally void. I mean, I think it, it was there, and, and it's within the power it's of a required. charter to provide rights that are not constitutionally okay. required. But it, it's my view that, that it was ill-advised, that it was done, on, I think, on a mistaken assumption as to the meaning of the Fifth Amendment, uh, and that it is uh, uh, bad policy. And, and Well, Lucas, you should move to strike it then. Well, he, he really is moving to put it back in. Put it back. <laughs> he oh, wants to put that. He, he, he wants language. to move to put the language put it, back oh, in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, our rationale is basically that um, the laws are a floor, not a ceiling for student rights. So the university could grant us all the due process rights that the courts do not offer us in regards to um, the university does not allow us to exchange evidence prior to a hearing. Um, we don't need to cross-examine witnesses. Um, I think that keeping this one line intact will allow students due process protection and allow the university to sort the truth in a much more fair, balanced process. Well, I'm uh, I, I want to speak on the on the other side. I'm in favor of deleting the provision. Uh, it is not required by law. That doesn't mean we don't have discretion to add it if we wish. I would argue against having it, however, because I think the fact finders should have the widest latitude to take all the circumstances into account in determining um, what happened. And, uh, and, and while a student's silence doesn't necessitate uh, a conclusion, uh, it should be one of the things that a fact finder could weigh. Um, uh, it, it, uh, in most cases, it would not be, but I can, I can imagine circumstances where a party's silence would be one factor that a fact finder would want to weigh in, in coming to the uh, best judgment about, um, about what happened. So I'm in favor of, <clears throat> of deleting it, both because it's not required, but also because it interferes with the discretion of fact finders to take all circumstances uh, that are relevant into account in reaching conclusions. And I also think it's right that, that we should have a single standard for faculty and students in our disciplinary proceedings. Faculty don't have this, uh, any provision of, of this kind protecting them. I don't think they should, but I don't think students should be treated differently. Any other comments? <coughs> Professor? There is a technical issue here. When, when the agenda came out, I, the agenda shows two versions of this policy, uh, one marked up and the other is not marked up on the, on the line. I, I discuss this policy with my students. I teach a course at the moment. And, and so I provided them with a markup. And then at, only this afternoon did I realize that the markup copy that's online does not include these changes. In other words, it's, it's marked up as if these changes were already approved by the committee, which they were not, yet because they were, they were not voted on last time. So, that's correct. There was only so, so there is no one co unless we unless it, unless the one we were just pa given today. Yeah. Well, it, yes. There is no one. Co oh, was I received no one copy of the markup that had all changes from between the original board copy and everything that's being voted on that didn't even exist as far. It certainly wasn't given to me. So that's I think not a good procedure. We should in one document in a single document have markups that illustrate all changes that go from the original to the new version. And we never really got that. And I, and one of those was an at issue was in fact this section that we're talking about. And so my students 
didn't they didn't see anything anything any problem here because there was nothing there. Uh, the the markups that were in today's agenda were trivialities. Uh, they were trying to slight changes in text. In fact, I was confused about this uh, myself, let, even let though me, I was here last time, me, and I should not address have been. that. Yeah. Yeah. This was just an administrative error. Yeah. At the last meeting, there was a complete markup. I know that, yeah, I see that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, everybody saw it, <clears throat> and then when the agenda and materials got assembled yeah. for today's meeting, and I just realized, learned this about an hour ago, yeah. uh, an incorrect, the markup that you see, it, it doesn't even represent the markup with the change that I did, that one change that right, I mentioned. Right. It, it, it came from an internal document. It was just right. a mistake. Somebody attached the wrong right. document. Right. So at the prior meeting, everybody saw the complete markup. The student representatives and the student government and my office right. have been discussing this change with real focus on this one right. provision for many, many right. months. So this, uh, yeah. this, this is not a surprise, and n nobody's been blindsided here. I do apologize, and somehow between my office yeah. and Frank's <laughs> office, we uh, we messed up, and the the, the so-called red line version uh, is not the correct line red line version. But the one that was before the committee at the, at the last meeting was uh, the correct red line version. It showed all of the changes. And, uh, and as I said, the students and I have been discussing this specific provision uh, for many, many months. And the document just handed out is the red line. With all uh, the the document just handed out is the same red line that was appeared that appeared before the committee last time. <clears throat> so, so the one that was on today's agenda didn't have additional changes. These were. They're, they're changes that were actually made before made before. before the draft, ah, before the September see. meeting. It was right. just an old document that was redlined, and it got attached by mistake. I see. Well, I got a call from Rick to discuss this matter yeah. last week. Did you call other members of the committee? I spoke to uh, the, the chair. I think we, you t were the only two that I, oh, okay. that I called at that time. Of course, I've discussed it with the student <coughs> government representatives for, for quite some time now. But anyway, I apologize for that. Well, the, the, that the, the point is that I, I, I like to get the input of my own students on these I'm issues. Sorry. And so I was not able to get that input. And because they came back to me and said, mm, 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 not, not near. Uh, and then only, only this afternoon did I realize why they came back saying nothing here. Um, so there it is. Okay. Anyway, uh, I guess, Lucas, did you want to make a motion to put that language back in? Yeah, I want a motion to keep the right to remain silent about some term of guilt in the bylaws as currently stated in the bylaws. Second. Can you repeat that, please? I would like to motion to um, preserve the right to remain silent without some term of guilt in Article 15, Section 4 to currently 4 as well. Is there a second to that motion? I just have a procedural question. If we voted on all the changes except for this one, then this motion has no consequence because the language is still the original language. Is that not true? No, I think we said we were going to vote on it with the exception, and then right. and then with the exception, with the exception. So that means that with that, given that exception, the language we have now at this point in time is the original language. No, no? the language no, that was just voted anything. on includes all of the changes. Look, oh. as a matter of Robert's rules of order, okay. we should have done the amendment first and then voted on yes, the whole document. Right. Yeah. We right. chose right. to do no, it that's, the other that's way. What, that's we what chose to do it the other way around. Very confusing. Yeah. But I, th I think yeah. it's now clear what we're talking about. The committee has approved the amendments, subject to the ability of the students to make this one additional okay. amendment. Okay. The amendment has now been proposed, and the question is: Is there a second? I'll second it as a matter of form. Yeah. Any discussion or questions? I just repeat what I said before. I think uh, this is not the way civil uh, cases generally proceed. I think students ought to be treated the same way that faculty ought to be treated as a matter of fairness. And I think fact finders in these proceedings need to be able to take all the circumstances that they deem relevant into account, including a student's, uh, including a student's silence, as they can if a, in a faculty. I, I, with a faculty member silence in a disciplinary proceeding. So I'm opposed to including this as a matter of fairness and as a matter of, uh, of giving our fact finders ma ma uh, maximum latitude to take all circumstances into account. 
I, I'm intending to abstain, and, and if we vote on this next time, I'll, I'll rule it. But right now, I'd like to, I, I do prefer to consult with my own students on this. Well, the, so. but this, this, this is it. It's going to the board in right, okay, December fine, 1st. Fine. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Fine. Fine. Any, other, any other comments? Fine. Yeah, I mean, I would like to uh, disagree. Um, I think that the civil courts operate by different standards, standard of proofs in regards to promise of the evidence and also um, clear and convincing standard. Um, we operate under one standard, promise of the evidence. Um, this low minimum standard um, might create the risk of erroneously depriving students of their rights in regards to um, removing the line will allow the committee to use that subject of guilt to satisfy the standard of proof, which is, again, minimal. We're not providing enough due process to students who are both accused and um, I think it's in the best interest of the university to move forward and allow this line to be included in the bylaws for both the sake of the student due process and also the integrity of our disciplinary proceedings. Any other comments? So if we want the, the statement not to be included, we would vote no on this motion. Yes. That's correct, because he's moving to add it to a document that does not now have it. So you would vote no if you wanted to agree with me and Rick. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I concur with uh, Chairman Schmidt's uh, analysis and, and also support uh, deleting the provision as we have discussed uh, for the reasons that have already been put on the table. Um, no more discussion. Um, all in favor? So a favor of Lucas's uh, proposal. Opposed? Opposed. Abstentions? The motion uh, does not carry. Now, uh, if I might, <laughs> I'm afraid there's one other error in the agenda, which is that the uh, uh, there, there is a uh, a second, uh, or rather a third action item, uh, which is the uh, the policy on on uh, uh, sex uh, based harassment and um, uh, sexual violence, which you have in your materials. It just got it just got omitted uh, uh, under action items. Yes. Um, so this is of course part of the same process that we've been discussing about uh, bringing our policies in line uh, with Title IX. Uh, of the Civil Rights Act and various amendments uh, and regulations of the federal government. Um, what we have done here are several things. First, under our prior policies, uh, Trustee, I mean, uh, Committee Member uh, Phillips, it's this document. I see it. this one here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the long one, the one with the table of contents. Right. Um, so we've done a few things uh, to uh, uh, amend and improve this policy. First, we brought together in one place um, policies that had been in different places before. Uh, under our old policies, the provisions relating to sexual harassment were in the anti-discrimination policy of the university, and then there was a separate policy on sexual assault. Uh, it was recommended some time ago by a number of people around the university that we ought to bring those together and be part of the same policy. Secondly, the policy has been strengthened uh, in a number of ways and brought into conformity uh, with federal law, including <coughs> stronger provisions about education and training, about support services, about confidentiality, uh, and, and, and how we go about handling uh, these, these uh, serious complaints. And then, uh, finally, it uh, was brought into accord with uh, federal policy and law uh, to have a clear definition of consent, uh, which had not been a part of our uh, policies before. Uh, the federal government did not dictate a particular definition of consent. They just said you have to have uh, a clear definition of consent. Uh, we have followed the lead of, uh, of the governor uh, and, uh, uh, well, let me put it this way. We had decided uh, to go in a certain direction, and it happened to be uh, consistent with what the uh, governor, governor proposed to CUNY, and that CUNY 
passed uh, recently, a SUNY passed recently uh, in a, one of its board meetings, uh, and that is to have a definition of consent that is often referred to as affirmative consent. And so those are the, the major changes. Um, uh, I, I would add a, a couple things. We have been in close communication with the governor's office and with SUNY because there is a desire by all of us to be on the same page uh, in, in this policy. Uh, the policy as drafted is quite consistent with the resolution that SUNY passed uh, uh, at the uh, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, at the urging of the governor. Um, but we continue to have conversations, and so it may be that there is going to be, between now and the board me meeting, some additional uh, tweaking of language. I think the basic concepts are sound and are there, and uh, I, I commend them to you for your approval. Um, but I did want you to know that there are these continuing conversations, um, and so uh, there, there may be some language changes, and I promise you they will be well uh, uh, redlined uh, uh, before the board meeting. Uh, one change that I'm actually interested in, and I would tell you right now, is I think the name of the policy is a mouthful, uh, and it would be much better if we just shortened it to the policy on sexual misconduct. Um, and uh, uh, I hope when we, since I know we're going to do a few changes uh, between now and the board meeting, that's that's one of them that I can uh, predict uh, um, you will see. Um, but there may be some others. But anyway, this is the this is the policy. It uh, I think in every way is in accord with Title IX. Uh, it, it it puts us in a consistent path uh, with uh, with SUNY, and most importantly, I think it provides a better. Uh, protection, a better training, uh, and a better and a clearer view of how to handle uh, these cases uh, going forward, which fortunately we have not had uh, as many of as other universities. I think not because we're more virtuous, but largely because we're more non-residential. Um, but but uh, but although <laughs> quantitatively we've done better. Uh, qualitatively, these still remain, of course, very important uh, matters and, and serious matters for our consideration. And so, this is this is what I. Uh, Rick, how to many you. cases typically arise where this consent issue would be a would be an issue? Do we get two or three a year, or? or I think it's less than that. I think it's less than that. If if you put to one side claims of sexual harassment and are just looking at, at uh, sexual assault, sexual violence, which is where the issue of consent really comes up. Um, first of all, over the entire university, I don't think we have more than a handful of such cases in a year, probably on the fingers of one hand, but maybe two. Um, and in, in terms of where the consent issue has come up, um, uh, you know, my memory is fallible and I don't have hard data. but. My guess is I can think of one or two uh, where this has been, you know, the issue of how you define consent has really been at, at the forefront. Uh, we've been f extremely lucky in that regard, um, and, uh, but I think we can assume that it will continue to come up, but not on a very common basis. Since, since the governor was so interested in this, and it's not really a problem in CUNY. Does that suggest that there's a huge problem like this in SUNY? I, I did, I'm just asking. Well, there was the the Cleary number, so you know that all of these things are reportable under the Cleary Act, right. and um, SUNY uh, reported its uh, Cleary numbers uh, this fall, and uh, there was a press report on those numbers, I and, and I think a number of people responded that they seemed they seemed high. I have no way of knowing whether they were higher than in past years or lower. Um, actually, the reality of this is that the better your policy, the higher your numbers, at least yes. temporarily, are going to be right. because it, it, people will be encouraged to come forward. It's not that the incidence has gone up, but the reporting has gone up, and that's a good thing. Right. Um, so, no, I, I think I don't think SUNY is 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 any any worse than any other large university uh, system. And in fact, SUNY had uh, reached a consent decree with uh, the Office of Civil Rights almost two years ago in this area. So I think uh, 
like us, they were very much on the right track. Um, and, uh, uh, but there were, I think those numbers were out there this past fall. Are the private colleges and universities under similar pressure from the governor to, to adopt affirmative consent? I, I can't answer that question. What I can say is that I have, uh, I, I believe that once SUNY and CUNY have adopted their policies, uh, that there may be some interest by the governor and the legislature in legislation that would cover uh, the private yeah, colleges well, and universities. If I'm not mistaken, Columbia has either adopted an affirmative consent uh, provision or is, has it under consideration. I think, that, I think that's um, correct. I mean, there's no real reason that the governor would, would focus on just CUNY and SUNY. I mean, this is an issue. Sexual assault is an issue in private colleges as well as, as, as public ones. Sure. Um, so They have dormitories. <clears throat> they have dormitories. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> and Columbia has been seeing a lot of uh, sort of controversial of, yeah. cases yeah. and yeah. the yeah. threats. Yeah. And most universities that find themselves in that situation have been looking at their policies, and most of them are awful, and this one is right. excellent. Right. And, you know, it, we hold ourselves out, and in fact, we are a non-residential university, and the number of residents is, is very small compared to our total, 274,000 students, approximately 3,000 in residents. It's a tiny percentage of what we are. But when you think about it, 3,000 residential students is the size of Williams. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. it's a college. Right. <laughs> so, so we have to be, you know, we have to be as diligent right. on this issue as, uh, as everybody else. Now, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor, this is your your report is for overview purposes and no, no, are, this this, so, this was intended to be. The, so so this is sure. not a bylaw amendment, so it doesn't require coming mm -hmm. before the committee twice. This is a mm -hmm. uh, a new policy for the board, which we and and I'm asking you to to to. Uh, approve this policy so that we can bring it to the full board on December 1st. It is also being presented today as an information item at the uh, Committee on Faculty, Staff, and Administration because obviously this policy impacts both students and faculty and staff. Um, and um, because we were also doing the amendments to Article 15 and because the definition of consent has really come up mostly in the context of student affairs uh, or student in the context of student uh, uh, conduct, um, we thought it made sense to present both of them to this committee as action items. Mm -hmm. I'll move it. Okay. Second. Second. Sorry, that's a Any discussion or questions? Just, just procedurally, I mean, I looked at the agenda and, I, and the materials and I didn't see it. Did I make a mistake? The, it's in the materials. It's it in the is materials. not on the agenda. Not on thought, the agenda. So I, I saw an earlier an version agenda. of the uh, yeah. of this and thought I'd corrected it to yeah. add it, and it didn't wind up on the final agenda. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. The motion is approved. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chancellor Frank Sanchez will now address the committee. Yes, I have a relatively short uh, report, but I do want to take uh, this moment to uh, recognize our, our new uh, USS chair and, and student trustee, Joseph uh, Awaji. Uh, just to, for a little bit of a background, uh, Joseph Awaji is currently pursuing a master's degree at Brooklyn College, specializing in natural and behavioral sciences. And in just this past October, I uh, was elected to be the 29th chairperson of the University Student Senate uh, for this academic year. He's born and raised in Ghana. Uh, Mr. Waji received his Bachelor's of Science in Exercise Science from Brooklyn College in 2007. And as an undergraduate, Mr. Waji was engaged in uh, his role as a senator at the Brooklyn College Student Government uh, the Forensics Debate Team, and the Academic Club Association, as well as serving as captain of the men's soccer team. Uh, during his ta tenure at the USS, as the USS Vice Chair for Fiscal Affairs under uh, Trustee uh, Mohammed Arshad, Mr. Waji was an integral part of the grassroots campaign that restored 
a merit-based scholarship within the New York City Council budget. Uh, with strong support from the City Council Committee on Higher Education, $11.1 million was included in the um, uh, fiscal year 2015 budget for a merit-based scholarship for CUNY students, and over 13,000 students will benefit from this scholarship. Uh, this is just one example of Mr. Waji's vision for USS. His vision is to mobilize students around key issues that affect CUNY students and continue to organize so that students can maximize their political and professional potential. And so uh, please uh, help me welcome uh, Joseph as our new student trustee. We also, uh, uh, Lucas Monte is also our new student representative. He's a senior at New York uh, City College of Technology and uh, in the law and paralegal studies and plans to graduate in June 2015. And we already saw a great display uh, of his work and interests in legal affairs. And so I'd like to also welcome Lucas. Uh, a couple of items to share with the committee. Uh, USS also held, held their annual awards recognition dinner um, uh, October 22nd, uh, just this past month, where they recognized a number of administrators and students who have done, uh, particularly students who have done outstanding work this past year. Uh, on the athletic front, uh, we had the Staten Island won the women's tennis um, championship, and they're now headed to the NCAA championships. Uh, women's volleyball championships will be this coming Friday at Baruch College, and men's and women's soccer will be this Saturday. Uh, the championships will be this Saturday at Brooklyn College. Uh, this Friday, November 7th, we'll be hosting our second annual Veterans Academic Recognition Breakfast. Uh, this was an opportunity not just to recognize uh, our top performing, academically performing veteran students, but uh, over the last couple of years, we've received quite a bit of interest from private industry and companies, and uh, we've invited a number of uh, companies to join us in this celebration and, more importantly, get to know our students. Uh, NBC Universal, CBS, the Municipal Credit Union, among many others, will be in attendance at this event. Uh, we also are, uh, this year, launched an expansion of uh, our food bank opportunities for, for students. In fact, there was a recent article in the Wall Street Journal that highlighted some of this expansion work. And our goal over the next couple of years is to double, if not triple, the pounds of food and the number of meals for our students and their families. Uh, in a similar fashion, we have also are looking at uh, expanding support services and a network of, of uh, programs and support for our students in foster care. We have about 1,000 students that are orphans and wards of the court across CUNY. And together with um, uh, Lawyers for Children, the Children's Aid Society, the Administration for Children's Services, and many other uh, non-for-profits, we're looking at expanding our support network for virtually every student who's in foster care who enters into CUNY. We want to make sure uh, to um, uh, ensure that they have the best chances of success. National studies show that students in foster care have uh, among the lowest graduation rates. In fact, national studies have that graduation rate range between 3 percent and 11 percent graduation rate of those that actually go to college. Uh, we think we can do a lot better than that. Um, and so we're looking to expand uh, better support for our students in foster care. And then finally, we had a very successful ninth annual uh, Black Male Initiative Conference. Um, we had record uh, attendance on uh, nearly 1,300 participants uh, this year, and uh, the, the Chancellor, Chancellor Milliken, uh, gave some remarks, as well as the Honorable uh, Inez Barron, the Chair of the Higher Education Committee for the City. Uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor. Any questions or comments? I have uh, one question about that um, just wonderful work that you just finished describing regarding CUNY's work with the foster care system and, and aligning uh, those young people with college opportunities. Is the city providing any formal financial assistance or, or support in that regard? So yeah, yes, this past week, uh, Senior Vice Chancellor Hershenson convened a meeting uh, with the Administration for Children's Services, uh, um, Commissioner Carrion, and several others uh, to talk about uh, how the city can engage in this initiative. I, that very, on that day, I was actually in Aspen 
uh, at the Aspen Institute uh, interacting with a variety of philanthropists also focused on foster care. There's a, a forum on community innovations uh, that the White House put together. And so I think there's not only city funds that are available, but potential num a number of uh, private foundations that are interested in this work. That's wonderful to hear. Um, any other comments or questions? <coughs> <coughs> May I have? Yes. I'd just please. like to note that the CUNY Academy is holding a reception on December 4th for Fulbright students who are at the university, and everyone here will receive an invitation to that reception. Okay. Okay. What date was that? The, the, December 4th, uh, a reception for Fulbright and other international program students in the university. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, on, I believe December. Oh, no. December 3, sorry, student trustee dinner. I apologize. No, not a problem. And where will this be held? At the Graduate Center in the Sky Library, 7 o'clock. <coughs> Anything, any other uh, updates? May I uh, have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The meeting is adjourned. Um, everyone have a great evening, and, and thank you very much for uh, the wonderful work done today. Thank you.